So today we are looking at the art of Gauguin, the second of the post-impressionist artists that uh, we'll consider. He was born in 1848 and lived through to 1903. And there's a certain degree of similarity with Van Gogh. They both have their breakthrough to a mature style in 1888, the year 1888. That is the year, um, really, of post-impressionism, you could say, because of that. We call him, as we call Van Gogh, a post-impressionist, but I think something is, needs to be said about that, and that is that the term post-impressionism is not one that either Van Gogh or Gauguin would ever have heard, or Cezanne would have ever, ever have heard. It was a term invented in the early part of the 20th century when an art critic called Roger Fry wanted to bring together the work of some of these artists for an exhibition in England. And actually, he just sort of grabbed the, the term out of the air. He wanted to call, I think he wanted to call them expressionists, but there was someone else in the, the room that didn't like that, you know. So in the end, he said, oh, well, let's just call them post-impressionists, you know. So. Uh, Sometimes as art historians we, we place a lot of emphasis on these style labels, but uh, actually for the artists they may be not important and the style labels may, may be not work very well to explain um, what is specific uh, about that art. We mustn't expect them to be too explanatory. Um, they may help at the very beginning to draw, draw rough pictures of how art was uh, developing but we you know it's not like that there were a set of rules written on the wall of here's the 10 rules of post impressionism you better obey them all you know now we're in the post impressionist era and you have to do it this way uh, it's all about a retrospective terminology or sometimes the terms are, are uh, those which come from people who don't even like the art itself like fauvism and cubism were kind of disparaging terms, really. Um, but they've stuck in the literature of art and abstract expressionism. Well, some of those artists weren't abstract. Some, it's hard to describe them as expressionistic, but anyway, the term is still there. So a little wariness about the terminology is, is, is a good thing. Color. Um, that's the most important thing, perhaps, for, for Gauguin, as it was for Van Gogh. Uh, they both um, explore color in a non-naturalistic way, explore the full possibilities of color. Maybe in Van Gogh's case, it's more an expressionistic use of color. Maybe in Gauguin's case, it's more decorative or symbolic use of color, you could say that but color is really important uh, to them. Whereas Van Gogh is an artist who works from nature, you know, he still takes his easel out into the landscape. Uh, Gauguin works more from imagination. He's more symbolic or imaginative kind of art. He, he abstracts further, you could say, from reality. That's a big difference between the two of them. They share some stylistic interests. They both go through Impressionism somehow, come out the other side. Um, they're both interested in the Japanese print and use it as a stylistic source. Another thing that links the two of them is that they're both artists whose life seems a bit, well, larger than life. You know, it, it's. Uh, there's a, a sort of mythic story about both of their, their lives. In Gauguin's case, the story is you know, he was a stockbroker and then he gave it all up to become an artist and eventually he goes to live in the, the Pacific island of Tahiti. You know, it's quite a sort of romantic story. And again, like Van Gogh's story, it's been made into two films and so forth. Uh, and we have to peel away the myth a little bit to get to the reality. Uh, so this is something that 
it's close to our core theme of vision in crisis is, is one aspect of that is encountering other cultures and their ways of understanding things. Um, so Tahitian culture uh, becomes a very important source in addition to the Japanese uh, print art which so many artists, not just Gauguin, had been interested in learning that there are other ways of representing the world, other ways of seeing the world, that's a, a kind of major discovery with lots of consequences for art. In Gauguin's case, it's not just a, an encounter with another. Uh, for him, at least in his thinking about himself, he is that other. And I explain what I mean by saying that his mother was half Peruvian. So he has something of the exotic within his own makeup. And he and his family went to Peru. He was in Peru uh, between the ages of three and seven, I think. And his father actually died on the boat going out. So there's that, that sort of link to France was cut at a very crucial part of his childhood. Uh, and before he went to Tahiti, he also made other trips to Martinique and Panama in 1887 during his formative phase as an artist. The, the Tahitian phase was at the very end of his life when he'd already formed his fully mature style. So m moving around, encounter with different culture environments, very important. You know, actually it's part of the modern experience to be in different places, you know, to be um, well, it's the biggest thing in the, the news at the moment globally is about refugees and migrancy, but it's actually a whole sort of theme of the 20th century. Uh, people moving from place to place, even you know, within countries, say within China, massive movements of people from rural areas to city areas, enormous uh, movements around. Many of the greatest artists of the 20th century are people who ended up living in completely different cu countries from those that they were born in. You know, Picasso, Picasso the Spaniard living in France because of fascism, you know, de Kooning, a Dutch artist who ended up in America, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, another sort of tra trajectory even within France is something I've mentioned with Van Gogh, a northern artist who comes down to to Paris and then to the south of France. Well, Gauguin, yeah, he's, Paris is important for him. He, he does a lot of his beginnings as an artist there. Uh, but he also has to leave artists. You need, you need leave Paris. You need contact with Paris as a big cultural center to progress and develop to your new style. But you also, it seems, need to escape from it in many cases. That's true with Cezanne as well, all three of those artists needed to get out of Paris in their later life. So he starts off as a, a stockbroker. He's a stockbroker till 1883. So he's, he's just sort of there in the, uh, leading a typical sort of bourgeois life, you know. And at a certain point, because of the downturn in the economy, that, that job disappears and his economic situation is really different. But it's not like he suddenly becomes a dropout and becomes, becomes an artist. Um, actually, uh, he'd already been painting for quite a long time. Uh, he had a work accepted in the Salon Art Exhibition in 1876. Uh, that's a very sort of mainstream success. Uh, in 1878, he became a friend of the Impressionist artist Pizarro, who encouraged him with his painting. And he exhibited with the Impressionists uh, in 1879 to 82. He was at exhibiting at the Impressionist exhibitions. Also, because that was the period before he lost his job in the financial services industry, as we would call it today, he could afford to buy their work. He was buying works by the Impressionists. He spent part of 1877 together with Pizarro at Pontoise, you know, painting side by side. So this idea of people in the uh, 
in mainstream jobs and then sort of giving it up to doing doing something creative. You, you see it all the time, you know, here in Hong Kong, you know, some former banker has opened a shop selling cupcakes or something like that. It's going on all the time, that kind of thing of people dropping out to various degrees to follow their, their dream. But Gauguin is a sort of archetype of that in a way. Uh, yeah, oh, so, sorry, this, so this is uh, one work that was exhibited in an Impressionist exhibition. Uh, this is uh, near the farm of 1885. This was in the eighth Impressionist <coughs> exhibition. So it's, it's broadly an Impressionist style painting. I'm going to talk uh, quite a bit about the sources of his style. Um, I often like to show some of an artist's early work because I think that is often overlooked and it's often a great help to us to understand how an artist's style comes together. And particularly in Gauguin's case, he's quite an eclectic artist, one who draws from different kind of art, puts different things together. Um, I'm making a comparison between this work, the uh, Breton Shepherdess of 1886, and this work by Pizarro. Uh, I'm cheating you a little bit in this uh, comparison because I'm showing you a Pizarro painting of a later date than the Gauguin painting. Just so, but my my point is about Pizarro's influence on Gauguin. I'm just sort of cheating with the examples that I happen to have at hand. But I think it's a similar kind of subject, and even the way it's treated, the slightly block-like treatment of the, uh, the, the figure, sort of lumpy sort of shape of the figure sitting on a wall, and uh, the same kind of pose of this figure here. Well, it's the same kind of subject matter, rural scenes. Many of the Impressionists like to paint city life, urban middle-class life, Renoir, Monet, um, very concerned with that, but Pizarro has a link back to the realist painters like Courbet in his concern for rural life. And here you see Gauguin, I think, following on with uh, Pizarro's uh, concern. As I say, they were painting side by side. He draws a lot of influence from Pizarro but not just Pizarro, other Impressionist artists are important to him as well. So I'll, I'll just go on to uh, look at that in a minute. But first I want to look at the influence from a post-Impressionist or neo-Impressionist artist, namely Sura. Um, Sura was the first of these artists moving beyond the Impressionism and to have his personal breakthrough. So we saw how he influenced Van Gogh, he also influenced Gauguin. Um, actually, I don't, I don't have a comparison slide here, but I, I, I did show you Seurat's work when we were looking at Van Gogh, so hopefully it's in your memory bank. His style was too, you know, he found uh, Impressionism too spontaneous. He wanted to sort of rationalize it. So he t took the broken brushwork of Impressionism, but turned it into almost a sort of mechanical, regular stroke partly influenced by new developments in color printing at that time. Uh, and Gauguin has taken that pointillist method of Seurat here in this painting. In fact, it turns out to be a dead end for him. He doesn't go down the route of Seurat. But it, it, the evidence of this image is that he is experimenting. He's not quite satisfied with Impressionism. He wants to move beyond it. So we're, what we're looking at is the still life with horse's head of 1886. Perhaps uh, more interesting in a way is the subject matter of the image, how he's brought together things from different cultural tradition. The horse's head is actually a, an iconic example of Greek sculpture. Um, it belongs to the one of the pediments of the Parthenon, 
great Greek temple on the Acropolis, and it, it lives now in London as part of the Elgin marbles in the, in the, the British Museum. Uh, Gauguin was well aware of it, so he's uh, copied that maybe from a cast or something like that. Often people, art students knew about classical art through, through casts made of the original sculptures. But he's juxtaposed that with something from a very different cultural tradition, things from Japan, fans and, and a, a sort of doll or puppet from Japan. So that's an that's a unusual kind of clashing, deliberate sort of clashing of cultural traditions, e East meets West and all that. There's not much Japanese influence on the style of the painting, it's just there in the subject matter, but at least it shows him as an artist who is concerned with breaking out a little bit of the, the Western tradition, not, or not solely staying within the confines of the Western canon, the Western tradition. And this idea of putting Japanese art and Greek art side by side, it's possible he got this from the American artist Whistler, who moved to, to live in France and later in England. He gave a very famous lecture in 1885, so just before this time of this painting, called the 10 o'clock lecture. And in that lecture, he, it, towards the end of the lecture, he says, the story of the beautiful is already complete, hewn in the marbles of the Parthenon, that, that's what this is, and embroidered with the birds upon the fan of Hokusai at the foot of Fujiyama. Well, he's talking about Japanese fans. So anyway, he puts the two image of the two together in his lecture, and possibly that's uh, a source for Gauguin in, in choosing to put the two of them together in his painting. It's almost like a manifesto, uh, in a way, uh, a manifesto about cross-culture, meeting of cultures, or something like that in art. But um, something you often get with Gauguin is his ideas being ahead of his practice. You know, in terms of the style of the painting, there's nothing cross-cultural, but there in the content of, of the painting, there is. Four Breton women. or the Breton Peasant Women, 1886. In 1886, he spent a bit of time in Brittany on the French Atlantic coast. From June to November, he was there in pont -a in Brittany, a rather um, you know, hard-to-reach part of the country. He returns to Brittany in, 19, in 1888 to 89 for a longer time period spends more time there. Many works belong to that period, but this is for his first shorter stay. Still with this uh, subject matter of the of rural life, which is there in Pizarro and there in impression, uh, you know, in realist art. But I think that the influence I most want to highlight in terms of style in this painting is that of Degas another Im uh, quite different Impressionist artist. Now, a lot of Impressionist painting is quite um, amorphous, you know, like a Monet painting that he didn't do drawings first. He didn't think in terms of line, of outline. He worked directly in terms of paint. And the boundaries of objects are very blurred deliberately. He doesn't want you to paint what he knows is that is distinct from that. He paints what you can actually see, and things may just blur together in your vision. Uh, but post-impressionist artists often want to react against that quality in, in impressionism. Impressionists were doing that to create a unified sense of the objects and their environment in, under natural light. But the post-impressionists often want to insist on boundaries. We saw that very much with Van Gogh, very strong quality of outline in a lot of his work. So here with Gauguin too, outline is really important, this lovely sort of rhythmic, sinuous sense of outline. These women are wearing the distinctive costume of the Breton region. If you go there today as a tourist, then you know, you'll see these costumes still on display. But um, you know, it, in visual terms, that helps to specify the separateness of objects, but create other 
formal level, it creates interesting shapes across a flat surface, two-dimensional design. And Degas, of all the major artists of the Impressionist generation, is the one who most held on to drawing, to line, to outline. Um, so actually he became more influential on the post-Impressionist than, than many of the other Impressionists for that reason. If this was Degas painting this scene, uh, uh, it's not a typical Degas scene, but uh, if it was Degas, I think he placed a little bit more emphasis on the psychology of the figures. That's a little bit sort of taken away in Gauguin's case. But apart from the emphasis on line, I think the, the having a central figure with their back to us, that's very common in Degas' painting. Here, for example, uh, I just pick at random a Degas ballet dancer painting, and you see uh, you know, um, the most prominent f two figures in the whole image have their backs to us. It's very common. So Gauguin has, has taken that idea. Also, this detail here of the figure adjusting her shoe, that's like the sort of detail you'll often get in Gauguin paint paintings of ballet dancer here scratching herself in another ballet dancer painting she may be adjusting her shoe and so forth um, I don't know how persuaded you are about this I mean it's, it, this is a influence it's a little bit hard to prove 100% there are some other Gauguin paintings where we can see in the background of a still life a detail of a, uh, a corner of a, uh, of a Degas print, say. So we, there are other images that could give us some proper evidence that this is the, uh, an influence from Degas. But uh, I, I think that that is definitely what's going on here. That's my, my, uh, my, my argument anyway. But more simplified and flattened out than Degas ever would have done less psychology. There's also something of another of the post-impressionist artists that we haven't really looked at yet, and that is Cezanne. The slightly sort of patch-like treatment of the brushwork is something that you find in Cezanne's art. Um, something else I'd like to talk about, a different aspect altogether, is the, the subject matter of the painting. What is it a painting of? It's a painting of uh, for women having a conversation, they're, they're, they're talking across uh, a boundary wall of some kind. So it's a painting about conversation. Now the question would come up, well, what language are they talking in? And maybe uh, uh, most people would assume, oh, well, French, right? But actually, no, it's not likely that they would be using French. Um, they would likely be using the Breton language, a language which Gauguin doesn't understand. Um, we're going back to a time when France would have been much more linguistically divided than today. Um, so I want to read this painting as being about Gauguin's sense of linguistic exclusion. You know, the fact that the figures are not looking at, uh, at us, not engaging with us, they have a, their backs to us, uh, helps to create that sense of outsiderness. So, so already maybe here's Gauguin making an image about being an outsider, even within his own country, country he's an outsider. Give you a few facts to um, back up this kind of reading. Um, when he first arrived in pont -Avon in Brittany, he sent a letter to his wife uh, um, saying, there are hardly any French people here. Now, that might seem a very strange thing to say. Surely these are French people. But in his way of thinking, no, these are the Breton people. A lot of other travelers to the region of a similar date also remark on the linguistic differentness or otherness of the region. Um, one lady who wrote a travel book in 1877 about 
Brittany said the Breton language is troublesome to learn as there are several different dialects in many villages in Finisterre, which is the part of Brittany where pont avant is, where Gauguin was, only a few of the inhabitants speak French. Um, another traveler in 1870, another writer, uh, travel writer in 1870 has an account in his book about a uh, a, a woman who can't speak French, and actually, the the, the linguistic history, uh, historic linguistic historians who've looked at this said, in this year, uh, they actually have figures from this year, 1886. Uh, there were 1,320,000 Breton speakers, and over half of those could not speak French; they could only speak the Breton language. Uh, and only about 5% of the people in the whole of Brittany could only speak French. You know, those were the basically the upper class people and the people working for them. And in a place like pont avant it didn't even get a railway link till 1903, and it was 10 miles by road from the nearest harbour. So you can imagine it's uh, uh, quite cut off from other parts of the, the, the country. It's only really a little bit later, I suppose at the time of the First World War, there's a certain kind of uh, unification of the language, especially amongst the men, but not so much amongst them, the women. So behind those kind of statistics about language, there's a picture perhaps of uh, a battle going on between the French state and the, 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 the regions, between centralism and particularism. The French state around that time was working hard to promote linguistic unif uniformity. Um, you know, for example, through the education system, there were some laws introduced in 1881 and 1882 called the Jules Ferry laws um, to try to make uh, education secular compu compuls compulsory um, the use of the Breton language was banned in classrooms and teachers and students were fined if they were found to be caught speaking it uh, so yeah, it's interesting it's a painting about language I would say at a time when language is an, a site of contestation it's a little bit like something we could recognized from Hong Kong. You, know, you can say there is some sort of contestation between Mandarin and Cantonese going on or between simplified and full form characters over the last few years. Um, so I think we can I identify with that kind of um, battle. And here's Gauguin coming in as an outsider. And I think in some sense he's trying to represent those issues and his own situation in, in relation to them we and he are on the outside of something. Going back to this question of the influence of Degas on Gauguin, give you a bit more evidence to, to argue that case. Here is Gauguin's um, Schuffenecker fa the Schuffenecker family of 1889. I'm jumping forward in time actually to a point where Gauguin already has found his mature style, but I'm doing so in order to try and um, talk about the sources of his art. You know, little bits of evidence on the background wall. We see it, what looks like a Japanese print. Oh, okay. Well, there's a bit more evidence of the kind of stylistic sources that he's interested in by that time. But uh, this family portrait, I think I'll could relate it to a, a very famous early Degas family portrait, the Bellaly family portrait. They're both family portraits uh, that are a little bit unusual in that they're not presenting a nice, happy family story. Actually, there's a certain sense of division between husband and wife in the Bellaly family portrait. The husband is sort of put on his own visually. There is a sort of barrier between him whereas and the rest of the family whereas the two daughters are strongly linked in with their mother in this sort of pyramid form and the black and white colouring that links them 
And there's something similar to that going on in the Gauguin. The easel works to separate out Schufenecker from his wife and children. And again, the three of them are linked together in a sort of pyramidal structure. So it's a, a, a family group portrait that shows something about emotional dynamics within a, a family setting. So I think to, to me this is evidence that uh, Gauguin has been looking quite closely at, uh, at the, uh, the work of Degas. Schufenecker was an amateur painter uh, and was quite instrumental in fact in trying to encourage Gauguin to, to, to pursue his own path as a painter and he helped him financially at a certain point. In this case I want to look at the possible influence of another artist, Cezanne. I already mentioned that Gauguin was interested in Cezanne's work as fellow post-impressionists. So there's some kind of interaction with Cezanne that, and as we learnt last week and as I'll say again uh, a little bit later on, there's also an interaction with Van Gogh. So although these artists have quite individual styles, they are learning from each other. In a sense, art is a shared la language. Um, even when art, art, an artist's work seems very individual, you, you can find probably there's been some kind of dialogue with other artists. You can't work in a, you know, you can't invent your own language because otherwise nobody can else will be able to speak with you. So, um, portrait of a seated woman from 1890. I, I could compare it to this Cezanne self-portrait, uh, a portrait of a seated woman. So, uh, uh, actually it's not the only one I can choose. I'm not saying it's specifically this work that he was inspired by, uh, but there are several female portraits by Cezanne that uh, have a similar quality. So this is a woman with a fan. Something about the almost mask-like simplification of the facial features, very reductive, breaking away from realism. Of course, in terms of the style too, this sort of knitted patchwork quality of the brushwork that you get in Cezanne, he sort of builds uh, his painting up almost like a tapestry or something where you can see the weave. That's something that uh, Gauguin is taking. Sim simplification, more interest in the forms themselves, not just in what the forms represent. Although in Gauguin's case, maybe it's a little bit more two-dimensional, more two-dimensional design, a little bit more emphasis on contouring than very distinct, distinct contouring than you get with Cezanne, but still the influence is there. Even more strongly, and in this case it's a specific influence, is uh, this Cezanne painting, uh, uh, Still Life with Compotier or fr Fruit Bowl by Cezanne, which actually Gauguin owned. It was one of the Impressionist and Post-Impressionist works that he bought when he was still able to do so. And uh, I think it was the last that he held on to. Gradually, he had to sell those things as uh, he needed money. But this one, I believe, was the one he held on to the longest. And I think you can see pretty clearly that the lands that the, the still life in the background of this painting is that Cezanne painting. First, when you when you first look at it, uh, maybe your impression is that these are actual objects on a table behind the sitter. But there are some clues maybe that indicate a sort of framing off of that scene. So he's playing with what is real, what is not real. Just as the whole painting is playing with that, you know, making you aware of two-dimensional design, making you aware 
that you are looking at a painting, not just uh, through a window or to some illusory wor real world. If you look at the angle of the, n the knife and of the drapery here, it's shifted slightly, so he's not made an exact copy of the Cezanne painting. He's sh shifted the details of it to fit the compositional needs of his own painting. So, you know, you can work that out for yourself, why the knife has to be that angle and not the original angle. What, what difference would it make? What, you know, just as in poetry, things rhyme with other things to create formal structure at the level of the poem. So in a painting, things visually can rhyme and echo each other. We'll, we'll come back to this painting when we talk about Cezanne in his, his own right. Okay, so that's the end of the bit where I'm talking about the different sources of Cezanne's art. Um, we'll, let's take our breaks a little bit earlier than we did yet last week, and then we'll come back to look at one of his important sort of breakthrough, uh, mature, early mature works, The Vision After the Sermon, or Jacob Wrestling with the Angel. So let's have a brief break here.